everybody. Welcome to the Abbeville Church of God. We're going to open up this morning. If you want to this when you're singing, we're singing the first song. Girl. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. God, we pray that you would open the eyes of our heart, that you would open our hearts and our minds to the message that you brought for us this morning. You want to pray, amen. Amen. Um, Catherine Goodwin, Vicky's niece, is expecting a baby and her blood pressure shot up. So keep her in your prayers. Also, we have a prayer for uh, Glenn Ellis. All right, so keep him in your prayers also. At this time, we have, this is a house of prayer. And at this time, we will love to have those come up that need prayer. We'd like to be prayed for. We'd like to pray for someone. 
We do it together. We'll anoint you with oil. We have this set if we come with one accord and cry out to God for what it is that we want for our community, for our children, for our family members, the lost ones that are around us. So at this time, if you have a need, any need, come on up. We'll be happy to pray for you. If not, you're welcome to stay where you are, but we would love to pray with you. We believe in the laying on of hands. We believe in prayer. So join us. If the council members would please come up and help us pray over them. Your hands this way, if you will. I'm having my battery changed Wednesday. Yes. My pacemaker, so yes. I need to be anointed. Yes, amen. Amen. If you would, just stretch your hands this way. Dear Heavenly Father, as we pray over the need, Lord, we know that we call on the throne room of grace. And as we cry out to you, you attend under our prayer, oh God. Lord, you tell us in your word that there's a promise attached when we come to you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, I believe right now you're going to reach down and touch these needs today. You're going to reach in the homes of those that are represented here. You're going to reach down in the hospital room where, where Brother Glenn is. Lord, touch him right now. Give him a mighty move in his spirit, man. Encourage, strengthen, Lord, and heal like only you can do. Lord, there's nowhere else we could go but to you for our need. We honor you. We praise your name in advance, and we give you glory because you're already working on our behalf. We honor you, Lord, and we praise you for being our God. God. Thank you, Jesus. We honor you. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done and all that you continue to do in our lives. I have a few announcements. To, tonight is our district service at Restoration Ministries in Greenwood, South Carolina. It's off of Florida Avenue, right off of South Main. It is at 5 p.m. this evening. Bishop Vermont from the District Overseer of Pakistan will be there. The Overseer. The Overseer yeah. of Pakistan. Over Pakistan. Is the Overseer of Pakistan. He will be preaching that service. An amazing man. Great word from God. Uh, Friday and Saturday, the 24th and 25th, will be the Youth Revival at Abbeville Pentecostal Holiness at 6.30 p.m. Also, Saturday, March 25th, the well will have, a, will have a service in the House of Refuge at 5.30 p.m., ages 18 through 25. Also, Monday through Wednesday, revival at Marshall Road Church of God at 6.30 p.m. So, if you're not in God's house this week, you better check up. Yes, sir. That's Apostle Scott Key. Yes. It'll be Apostle Scott King, so definitely you do not want to miss that. You definitely do not want to miss that. So join us in God's house this week. The scripture today is John 10, 9 and 10. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And we'll go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and that it, and they may have it more abundantly. Now, it does not mean financially. Abundant life is a joy in your heart where you are without any need. Christ fills all those needs. So let us remember that we have life and more abundantly in Christ. If the ushers would come up, please. for the gift we have received through the sacrifice of your son Jesus. We are able to be one with you again to come back to what we have lost through disobedience at the beginning. 
what was done by your son Jesus Christ on the cross has opened a door for us to be redeemed through the blood. We honor you for the gift of salvation, and we know that it only comes through repentance, a turning away of who we used to be, and only by turning towards you can we become what you have created us to become, Father. We pray over the tithes today. Let us be joyful givers, and may it be used for your service, for your people, and for your house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. 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 amen.
singers, thank you musicians. Just lift your hands toward heaven. We've got some things we'll do at the end of the service, but I, I just feel the need to go straight into the message. 
Um, it's so good to be in God's house. Come on, don't lose your focus. Don't lose your focus. It's so good to be in God's house. There's a lot of places you could have went today. There's a lot of things you could have uh, partook in today. But I can tell you when you get in the presence of the Lord, where the presence of the Lord is, there is freedom and liberty. Where the presence of the Lord is, there is revitalization. Where the presence of the Lord is, you can feel renewed in your spirit, man. You know what? I truly believe that all things are passed away. And behold, all things have become new in the presence of the Lord. Yes, yes hallelujah. Yes. Let's just give God an ovation of praise this morning. Yes, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. One more time. We didn't do good enough. Let's give God glory in his house. Stand to your feet. We're talking about the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Give God in this house today. Yes, hallelujah. Mm. Yes, hallelujah. We extol you, O oh Lord. We exalt you. You are the rock that we can climb up on that gets us above all of our issues, all of our problems, all of our enemies. You are our strong tower, our shelter, a very present help in a time of need. We love you, we honor you, and we give you praise in your house. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I'm calling my people back to a life of faith, back to a life fervent with holiness. I'm calling my people. Then I will give you victory for all of your battle, and I will be for you a foundation that cannot be shaken, that is immovable. I call you, stand firm, and see my word and my power as it manifests in your daily life. Oh, so, Jesus. Just then, the Lord of hosts. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> We glorify you in this place, O oh Lord. We thank you for your visitation, O oh Father. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mm. Have your way, O oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, we honor you. We give you praise. We glorify you, O oh God. We thank you for the cross of Calvary. Yes, hallelujah. We thank you for the work of the cross of Calvary. We thank you for the empty tomb this morning. We thank you for the ascended Lord. We thank you for the comforter that you sent us. And we thank you that you're coming back to get us one day. Lord, we honor you in this house. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. You can be seated if you can. You don't have to, but you can if you want to. Yes. 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 Hallelujah. You don't have to wait to get to heaven to see the power of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Yes, hallelujah, hallelujah. And he'll do the same yes. for everybody that's 
faith. Yes, hallelujah. We need to be faithful and yes. to be true to what he promises in his word. And yes. We praise you. We honor you. Let's give God glory in the house. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. I am the God of promise. What I have promised you, I will fulfill. I am calling you back to a place of reverence and honor to me. When you honor me, I will heal you. I promise you in my word that when you call on me, I will attend unto your prayer. I am your father, and I am able to do exceedingly more than you can fathom or imagine. All you have to do is ask of me. I am your God, and I am holy, and I am righteous, and I love you, says the Spirit of the living God. Mm -hmm. Yes, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be coming from verse 25 through 34 today. As you're finding that, I was doing some research. As I, let me step back a moment. Over the last four or five weeks, I have talked to folks, believers, that have battled worry and anxiety to the point that it has overshadowed them. It has almost seemed to set in their life like a dark cloud. It has almost become uh, an oppression on them. I have encountered people who have been stricken with debilitating mindset that they didn't even feel like they could get out of the bed because of it. I have encountered those believers that have said they're just going to throw in the towel. It's not worth it anymore. And the Holy Spirit took me to, to do some research, and he took me to a place in Matthew chapter 6 to help me understand that there is an answer for worry and anxiety. There is an answer for it, and it's only found in God's Word. You can't find it in a doctor's office. You can't find it in a self-help book. It is going to be found in the Word that was breathed from on high, that was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The only place you will find it is in God's Word. So I did some research this week. There's an estimated 31% of U.S. adults in America experience anxiety disorder. 31%. If you figure out how many adults there are, there's 258 million adults as of 2020 in the United States of America. If you do the math, that's about 81 million adults. Not this is over the age of 18. 81 million adults in the United States of America are dealing with uh, uh, anxiety disorder to the point of some of them have taken their lives, to the point of not being able to get out of the bed in the morning, to the point of being a, a, a shell of the person they used to be. So I went on a little further. According to Wheaton College Institute that study evangelical Americans, in 2020, there were about 33%, this is their number, of all adult Americans, the population, 33% of them claim to be evangelical Christians. That's 90 million adults that claim to be Christians over the age of 18 in America. 90 million. So I got to thinking and pondering some things. I'm thinking, Lord, you said in your word that we could be victorious. You say in your word that you're a very he present help in time of need. You say 
stay in your word, and I believe every word of it. I don't believe any of it as a fable or a fairy tale. I believe every word that you have spoken through the Holy Scriptures to us. There's promises there. Lord, what is going on? If you go a little deeper, just about half of every congregation that claims the name of Jesus is struggling. About half of that 90 million is struggling with worry and anxiety. So I said, Lord, you told your disciples when you commissioned them to go into all the nations and preach the gospel. You commissioned them, but you told them this thing, and it kept coming to my mind. You said, teach those the commands that I have taught you. And then go on and baptize them. And then go into all the world and teach and preach this gospel. What have we been teaching and preaching? <laughs> What have we been teaching and preaching around the world? What have we been teaching and preaching in our homes? Because our kids are growing up with worry and anxiety. They have become so oppressed by this, this spirit of depression in their lives at young ages that they don't know how to function anymore. They don't even go outside. They can't even go to the bathroom by themselves today. But Jesus teaches us a lesson. And if you just think back, I hope you read your Bible enough to understand some things. I, I don't have time to go into all of this. In Matthew chapter 6, the first part of it, there's a disciple wanting to know how to pray. And Jesus teaches this disciple what we call the Lord's Prayer. And you get on down to about verse 25, and three times between verse 25 and 32, 34, I'm sorry, he tells them three times. He gives them a command. Remember what Jesus commissioned the disciples? Go and teach the commands that I have taught you. He gives them this command. And it's three words. Do not worry. Three times. Between verse 25 and 34. He gives them three times this command. Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. Now, the Bible also says this. Those that know to do right and do with it not, to them it is a sin. This is a command from the Son of God. This is a command from, from the one that would go to the cross and lay down his life for you and me. This is a command from, from the one that would get up out of the grave, resurrect himself by the power of the Holy Spirit, his own power. He would get up out of the grave. And he said... Do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. But here we are in 2023. Every time we turn around, we're worried. Every door we open, we worry what's on the other side before we even open it. Every time we go to the doctor, we worry. Every time we ride down the road, we worry. Every time our kids leave our house, we worry. Every time they have a sniffle for some reason these days, we worry. Church, that is not the life that God intended us to live. Amen. That is not the life that he said, I'm going to bring life to you and give it to you on an abundant measure. That is not the abundance that he was trying to give us. Amen. That is not freedom. That's bondage. Yeah. Help me, oh God. Let me read this to you. Matthew 6, verse 25 through 34. It says, therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. He goes on to tell us some things, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they are? 
<clears throat> Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Therefore do not worry. Number two, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, number three, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Why do you suppose Jesus says this so much? Do you think it's because that human beings are inclined to worry? Do you think it's because we let everything affect us in a way that we should not? Do you think, because he had foreknowing knowledge about his creation, he knew what they would come up against. He knew what his disciples would worry about. He knew that they would say, Lord, we don't have much to eat today. And he reminds them to look at the bird. You know, I'm a hunter, avid hunter. I love it. I find peace and serenity sitting up in a tree, <laughs> hunting. I find peace and serenity. At daylight when you hear a turkey gobble, I find peace and serenity. When I used to raise rabbit dogs and I'd run them and I'd hear that ball sound of their, sounding like a siren go off as they're chasing a little cottontail or a swamp rabbit. I would find peace and serenity. The reason why I would find peace and serenity is because I looked at nature. And I have yet to see a bird sitting on a limb with its mouth open saying, what am I going to eat? <laughs> I have yet to see a little deer walking through the woods frantic about what they're going to eat. I have yet to see the most majestic bird, in my opinion, of all time, the eastern gobbler, worry what was going to be provided for it that day. You know why? Because God said, I'll take care of that. But you know what? God just doesn't drop heavenly worms down for the bird to open his mouth and eat. You know what the bird has to do? It has to fly out of its nest in the morning. It has to get to the ground. But the bird doesn't worry. He knows God's already got a worm for him. Come on. He just flies to the ground and pecks around and finds it. But yet we get up and worry about everything. You know what that tells me? That nature has more faith. Mm. than humanity. Nature has more faith. Jesus even says here, oh, you of little faith. He's not talking about the pagans here. He's talking to his own people. He goes on to say, he said, you're acting like the Gentile. The, the word Gentile here is, 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 is translated from unbeliever, pagan. They worry but you're supposed to be mine. You're supposed to be a child of God. Why do you worry? I've already promised you. I'm a God of prevent. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The issue is we don't know who God really is. Come on, come on now. We claim his name, but we don't even know who he is. We don't even know that he cares about one hair that's on your head. We don't even realize that when a hair falls out, he's taking account of it. But yet we worry. You know, we just come through what they say is probably the toughest few years that humanity has ever faced. I don't really know about that. I think they made it to be, but I don't really know if it's the toughest few years. Come on. 
I think they politicized it so much to make us worry. Mm. I, I'm just going to go off the hip today. Uh, could you go back to verse uh, 19? But verse 19 to verse 6. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Mm. It says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Going down to the next one. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven whether, where neither moth nor rust, no, rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Verse 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 22. Now listen to this. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Go on down. Here we go. No one can serve two masters. Come on. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. This word mammon is talking about money or wealth. That was an issue in the time. They didn't have a lot of money. They were struggling in this time. The context that this was written, God was, Jesus was himself was, was teaching them something. But this can be, this word mammon can be a lot of things. Yes, sir. In other words, this word mammon is anything that is out of the providence yes. of the Almighty. Come on. Listen to me here. No one can serve two masters. You buckled up? You ready? The reason why so many of us worry is because we're trying to serve two masters. This word master here means controller. Jesus is telling his disciples, you cannot worship other things. If I am in control of your life, you got to give me total control of it. But you're, you're saying, I'm worried about tomorrow. We're worried. Now, I'm not talking, let me clarify some things. I'm not talking about legitimate concerns. You have a right to be concerned, but you do not have a right as a believer to worry. <laughs> If you consider yourself a child of God and you worry all the time, let me tell you, Hebrews 10, 26. Listen to me. It says, for if you sin willfully, after you receive the knowledge of the truth. What is the knowledge of the truth? The Word of God. Who is the Word? Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. Who is that? Come on, y'all need to help me here today. I'm going to preach three hours if you don't. <laughs> Jesus, the Son of God. Yes. Okay. Here we go. If He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and He's in control of the believer's life, then why do we give control if we're believers to worry? Come on. Legitimate concerns. I am concerned when I see my baby girl or my eldest girl, who is my baby also, both of them I love dearly. When I see them go through things, I am concerned. But if I let worry creep in and become my God, come on. You hear what I'm telling you? Come on. Some of you need to hear this good and loud and clear. If you allow, uh, you are worshiping a false God, an idol, you have set up worry to be that thing that you go to, you run to at every turn of your life. And now. You can't function as a believer. You don't walk in power. You still claim the name of God, but you don't have the power that he said he would give you because worry is always here. Yes, sir. Come on. You know, we're supposed to be sober-minded. We're supposed to be vigilant. Yes. You cannot be. I'm not talking by cause I just read it in a book. You're looking at somebody that was diagnosed for 10 to 12 years. Ask that little lady right there. I put her through literal hell with nocturnal anxiety. The worst kind of anxiety you can even have. You wake up in the middle of the night, full-blown anxiety. But you know what the problem was, Ralph? I decided I was going to have it the rest of my life. Wow. So guess what I did? I would go to the doctor. Give me this. 
make me feel better. Give me that. Make me feel better. Now, I want to clarify one more thing. Some of you have some chemical imbalances. That chemical imbalance a lot of times lays dormant for a while. Listen to me. Hear me good. You stoke the fire of that chemical imbalance. When you allow the enemy of your soul to come in and cause you to work, you want to know why your anxiety gets really high? Because you're fanning the flame of that chemical imbalance by worrying. Guess what? The further we get away from the creation, that royal blood, there's going to be issues in this body. But the promise still stands. It still remains. God is still the creator. And he created this on the sixth day. Out of everything that he created, he said, this is the apple of my eye. And I desire to be their father. Let me take it a step further. I desire to be their daddy. Come on. You hear what I'm telling you? He desires to be the one that gives you what you need, when you need it, right on time, not a minute too late. Come on. Help me, Holy Spirit. I told you I'm going off the hip. I got tons of notes, but he said just go with it. I'm giving it to you as you speak it. Listen to me. Every time worry comes in, little sister, every time, that is an opportunity for you to pray. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. Y'all know it. But in all things, do what? Prayer and supplication. Every time you feel anxious and worried, that's an opportunity for you to hit your knees and call out to Daddy and say, Lord, I need you right now in this situation. I need a touch from on high. I need you to minister in it. But what do we do? We go talk to somebody else. Come on now. And instead of talking to the one that says, I'm going to give you peace, at the end of this scripture, what does it say, verse 7? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart, minds through Christ Jesus. The one that can give you that peace, Mm. you neglect to go to him. See, some of you need to get away from those that entertain your worry and your anxiety. Some of you need to stop talking to those that fan that flame in your life. And you know what? The enemy is using them in your life to keep you oppressed and pushed down so you'll never walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's high time that the church of the living God rise up like a mighty army in love and say, guess what? I don't know what holds tomorrow. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds me in the tomorrow. Most of us crucify ourselves between yesterday and tomorrow. Come on. Go back. I'm sorry, Ryan. I know I'm working you to death, but I love you, man. <laughs> Go back to verse uh, uh, 28 of chapter 4 of, uh, I mean, chapter 6 of Matthew. So why do you worry about clothing? Consider lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Listen to this. He goes on in the next verse and says, And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of the... Listen, you'll never see a lily sitting at a sewing machine worrying about what it's going to wear the next day by trying to make itself a garment. You know why? Because the master, the master provides for the field and he provides for the grasses of the field, the lilies of the field. If he will provide for those things that don't have a soul that he didn't breathe life into, he'll provide for you and me. Come on. Going down to the next verse, brother. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, just what I said, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... See, grass was used in that day to make fuel. Listen to this. Listen to this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. He just brought this to my mind. The very thing that he clothed, the lily that he clothed, he was doing it purposefully because he knew one day 
He was already making provision for what, the, for what humanity needed because that very lily, that very grass would be used for fuel to bake bread. Did you catch that? He said, I'm providing for the lily because I'm thinking of you. Come on. Mm. Do you hear what I just told you? I'm providing the lily to be able to be strong and stand because there's a day when it's going to die out. And it, for it to die, I'm going to provide something for you in this lily's death because I love you more than I love the lily. Wow. And it don't worry because it knows I've already provided for it. Go to the next verse. Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? You know, God's going to provide for us. But we've got to be faithful. We've got to be faithful. See, our issue is we have become like here in the Scripture he calls the Gentiles. Actually, translation, it's, it's unbelievers, pagans of that day. Pagans. They would go out and they would work. They'd say, I got to do this because I got to provide this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And they were planning for the future, which there's nothing wrong with planning for the future. But he kind of tells us where our treasure should be in, in, in some passages here. He said, you got to lay them up in heaven. See, we get so overwhelmed because we don't feel like we're laying enough up here. But I tell you, what if you worked all your life? Many people have done it. Many stories about people I know that worked with me at Eaton for years and years and years. They get to retirement, don't live a month or so after they retire. They worked all these years and laid up. They never thought about what they could lay up in heaven. They only thought about what they could lay up here on earth. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. So we got to make sure there's nothing wrong with, with, with being a planner. God is a strategic planner. Jeremiah 29, 11. He just didn't say, well, well, I'm just going to throw something together one day and it's going to be for you. No, he said, I know the plans that I have for you. He's talking about before you were even born, God knows the plans that he had for you. Okay? So he strategically plans. We should be that way. But we're not God. We can't see into the future. So we have to trust him for our future. See, too many times we worry about what's coming. And we don't even take care of today. Mm -hmm. Too many times we worry about tomorrow. And God said, I got some things you need to take care of in your life today. He talks about eating. He talks about clothing. That's what they were worried about. What they should have been worrying about was they even going to wake up in the morning to eat it. <laughs> what they should have been worrying about was they even going to have an arm to put a piece of clothing in in the morning. See, we get focused on all of these things in life that become a controlling. And it's that we begin to have two masters in our lives. And we show God that we don't really trust Him because we believe our worry over Him. And we start letting our worries and control, and then letting our worries control us to the point that we can't even function. Many times we can't even pray anymore because we're so stricken in our mind. We say, there's no use. It's still going to happen. When are we just going to let go and let God have his way in our life? When are we just going to allow God to be God? Because he's not going to be God half the time. He's not a part-time father. He don't get weekend visits. He's a full-time God. And if you'll surrender your life to him, he'll provide what you need in the moment that you need it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Trust the one that's already into your tomorrow. Come on, man. And his name is God. Almighty. Listen to me here. You know, we have taught so long, and Lord help me here, I don't want to be offensive to anyone. We have taught people so long, just come to an altar, say a prayer, get up, and you're saved. That's what we've taught them. So we've taught them to trust God with the eternity, but don't trust God here and now. Ah, come on, that's good. Let's go. We've got people walking around, worried out of their mind, taking 25 different medications. Nothing wrong with medication. It's scriptural. I'm not going to go into that today, but it's scriptural. God gives things through medication to help you. But that is not your healer. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Right. Right. Come on now. Amen. We got people get up from an altar that don't know how to even overcome their worries, and we're telling them, you're okay. And they're still serving two masters. We forget to teach them that there's some surrender that takes place. See, I'm amazed even in our own nation, I may get in trouble for it, but that's okay. I've been in trouble before. I'm all right with it. I'm big boy. I can handle it. We got folks in the church of God don't even teach sanctification anymore. Wow. It's still the second. See, that's the problem. We tell them you get all you need at salvation. There's still two more works of grace that you need to go through if you want to fully walk in the power of the Lord. You still need to be sanctified. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know what? We got a lot of folks claiming the name of God that don't even know there is a Holy Spirit. Come on. That can empower them to overcome the worst day of their life. Come on, man. I see it all the time. I see it all the time across our region here. I talk to them. Like I said, I've talked to more people in the last five or six weeks that claim to be a believer. But they don't know who God really is. Come on. They don't know his provision. They don't know God's providence. Mm -hmm. See, when you're his, you don't have to worry. <laughs> you can be concerned. You can be concerned about things, but you definitely don't have to worry. Yes, he goes on to tell us here, that what man or woman can add one cubit to himself by worry? If you can't add anything to your life by worrying, why do we do it? Why? You can't. Listen to me. Boys and girls worry. They worry about a storm coming. It thunders. They worry. But not too long after that, they get over it. When the sun comes back out, they go outside and play, and they forget about it. See, that's a concern. That's not truly, uh, truly uh, what I'm talking about as serving a master. There's some concerns that we have. If we see a tornado, don't do like I did as a teenager and say, I'm going to go drive in it. <laughs> and then run off in a ditch and water's running through my windows this way. And I'm sitting in it with water up to my neck. I climb out, didn't have a shirt or shoes on, just some cut-off shorts. And our neighbor, uh, John Dara, said, Pastor, preacher, your son's down here with water running through his windows. <laughs> John asked me, said, what in the world are you doing, son? I just want to drive in a tornado. <laughs> Don't be that fool, because that's foolish. <clears throat> Don't tempt the Lord thy God. <laughs> Don't tempt him. That's right. That's right. But honor him. Yes. Pray for his guidance in situations. Be concerned, but don't let worry overcome you. Hmm. There's too many of us. Too many of us live our life answering to worries hmm. instead of surrendering to God. Yes. See, but the only way you can surrender is if He truly is your Lord and Savior. The only way that you'll feel the peace that He's talking about if you serve only one master. I know some of you have been in church a long time. You say, well, I worry every day. Well, you need to read this again. Mm -hmm. You need to read it again. It's an awakening if you allow it. It will, it will revive your spirit, man, to understand who God is. We quit teaching people under the anointing, listen to me, I might get in trouble for this, but I don't care. Uh, we quit teaching people under the anointing about who God really is, and we started teaching from some book that a professor wrote that is handed down through seminary and said, this is who God, I, I was talking to somebody, and I'm sure that some of our people won't like, it. I was talking to somebody one day this week, and, and we got people who believe that there's a, a, a mother God. Right. Mm. And they want to teach it. I ain't talking about some outlandish. No, I'm talking about in the church of God. Wow. You see where I'm going with this? Wow. You wonder why our churches are full of worry and anxiety? Because there's people in the pulpit still don't know who God is. Right. They still don't understand what his providence is.
Alex is. They still don't understand who is Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Shalom. They don't know who that God is. It's time we get back to being biblically sound, scripturally taught, Hallelujah. and not somebody's opinion of something that they throw out as the word of God. It's time that we understand who God really is in our life. Come on. Come on. Hmm. Psalms 56.3. You know, most of us worry when we're afraid of things. Psalm 56.3 says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Yes. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. You notice the first thing we should do when we become stricken with fear and, and afraid and being afraid is to trust in the Almighty, not trust in anything else. The first thing a lot of us do, and I'm talking to some of you men here, well, I trust old Smith and Weston. <laughs> what you going to trust when the firing pin goes out? <laughs> what you going to do when the safety won't click off? I carry, I'm a man who loves guns. But I don't trust in Smith and Weston. I trust in Jehovah. I trust in Yahweh. I trust in the King of kings and Lord of lords. Because I don't protect my family with Smith and Weston. I protect my family by anointing my house with oil and praying over it. I to protect my family with the God of glory. Yes. You know how many people are dead today who say, well, I'm just going to trust this old firearm. Matt Dillon, John Wayne. We got a bunch of John Waynes in the church today. They don't know who God is, but they know who Smith and Weston is. Come on. Yeah, I'm a little upset because this is who's leading our churches today. But yet we got a, half our congregations are stricken with worry and anxiety. Come on. And most of them are carrying a gun, but it ain't helped their worry. It ain't helped their anxiety. That's right. Come on. You got to trust God again. That's right. You got to trust the one that on the sixth day, listen to me, you look good. Right. He just didn't say, humanity. He came down, he gets down, and he picks up some dust. And he puts that holy mouth to it. And he breathes the breath of life into it. And he said, this is the prize of all creation. Right here, humanity. Because you know how much he thought of it? He said, Jesus, we're writing a plan. Before I create anything, we're writing a plan called redemption. Well, I'm sure some angels looking around said, what you going to redeem? There ain't nothing down there. It's void. He said, but I got a plan. I'm going to create, and on the sixth day, I'm going to create the thing that I'm going to love, and I'm going to take on flesh and humanity, and I'm going to carry their cross to Calvary and die for it. That's how much I love them. And the angels couldn't understand it because they were created in the presence of the Lord without excuse. But here we are on a place called planet Earth. When God's three realms of heaven up and the third heaven where his throne, listen to me where his throne still today it has not changed above that throne there is a halo that looks like a rainbow to remind him of every, listen to me every promise he has made to humanity you know how I know it because John said I looked at the throne and above the throne was a rainbow the rainbow signifies the promise. But he said, oh, coming out from around that, I'm getting excited. Coming out from around that rainbow, there was this shining color of green. It looked like emerald, he said. You know what that represents? The thing that's there every day when we get up, no matter what's going on in our life, it represents his mercy. Yeah. Woo! Somebody don't feel what I feel in here. It represents his mercy. On the day that you're stricken with worry, when the doctor's giving you a bad report, you reach in to grab a hold of God's mercy. It'll carry you through. Mm. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's better preaching than you amen in today. Mm. God loves us so much. He does not want us walking around worrying. And being overcome with anxiety. I'm telling you, anxiety 
is one of the worst things in the world that a human being can ever go through. Anxiousness. To try to go through life. All of a sudden, be in a room with crowded people. They give it all kind of names. Social disorder, social anxiety, nocturnal anxiety. They've got a name for every anxiety. The root of it is worry. The root of it is not being able to trust the one that controls your tomorrow. That's the root of it. That is the root. I don't care who you are. I don't care how many times you shouted. That is the root of your worry. Because you're still teetering between two masters. Come on. See, I know some of you are getting upset at your pastor today, but I love you enough to speak the truth because I don't want to see you go through this life one day longer, one second longer with worry being part of it. There's something that happens when you surrender it all. The Bible says, you'll know a tree by the fruit that it bears. Listen to me. Listen to me. What could you do to save your kids if they were dying with cancer? Nothing. Oh, well, well I'm just going to love them enough and it doesn't work that way. What would you do to try to save your spouse from an intruder coming in when you wasn't there with Smith and Weston. You're in a different state. They're by their self. Some of you are getting a little worried now and anxious. I'm going to give you the answer in just a minute. What would you do? What I have found is the only thing that works. There's a lot of means that we have at our disposal to think that we can do things and think that we can control situations, but really we cannot control any situation outside of God's providence. You can't. So just come to grips with that, and under, that's what I had to do. I was very controlling. I like to control the situation. If somebody wanted to fight, I was the man that wanted to fight them. If somebody wanted to, to go play some sport, I was going to go control it. I wanted to win at everything I did. But when I found out that the only way I could win in this life was getting on my knees and surrendering all that I am to the Most High and Him controlling my life, my life, I started experiencing the peace. Some of you ain't experienced one day of peace yet because you have not fully surrendered to Him. Come on. Now, a lot of us have said we committed, but I don't want you to commit today. You know what they do with crazy people? <laughs> they commit them. I don't want you to commit today because you ain't crazy. There's somebody that's got sound mind that surrenders to God. I want you to surrender your life to God wholeheartedly. I'm not talking about coming down and saying this westernized prayer. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about saying, Lord, here I am. My life up until this point has been in one mess. And I couldn't control it. I couldn't. I tried to clean it up every way I possibly clean it up. I'm surrendering it all to you. My life, see, this is what we say we believe, but most of us don't believe it. My life is not my own. Hmm. Mm. But the whole time we're saying my life is not my own, we're trying to control our life. We say we believe God for our eternity, but we don't believe God for the here and now. The physical side of things. The physical side. See, it's time that we surrender as a body again. But individuals... If you're struggling with worry about all kind of different things in your life, say, Lord, I'm concerned. Hmm, thank you, Holy Spirit. Listen to this. This is what we do most time. Well, I got this situation going on, and I'm a believer, but you need to change how that but works in your life. <laughs> you hear me? You say, well, I'm a believer, but this situation... 
What you need to say is this situation is pretty bad and I'm concerned, but my God yeah. supplies all of my needs according to his riches and glory. Listen to this. Mm -hmm. I'm a believer, but the doctor said... Time out. Start over. I'm a believer, and the doctor said this... But I believe in the great physician. Yes. I believe yes. his word is sovereign over all things. And if this takes me out, I'm going to a better place anyway. I'm going to a place that he's laid up for me. And, and my, my, my life is going to be represented in the glory of God. And he's going to transform me from glory to his glory. Amen. When you start having that mindset... Your life changes. There's freedom in that. There's liberty in that. <clears throat> Too many of us call ourselves believers and we're walking in chains. Mm -hmm. That's an oxymoron. Did I say it right? Good. Good. <laughs> I had to ask my college folks. They know what I'm talking about. <laughs> to be a believer means you have freedom yeah. spiritually. To be a believer means that I'm not stricken with bondage. I don't drag this old ball and chain that's trying to hold me. That's all this thing is about. The enemy's trying to hold you back yes. from going forward with Christ. And if he can cause you to worry and be stricken with anxiety, where you spend most of your time thinking on those things, you won't have time to think on the God things. If anything be good, think on these things. I know some of us have had some things go on in our life here recently. We've had children be sick. We've had fathers and mothers who had some diseases. But I'll never forget, and I never get tired of telling this story. Thank God. Thank God. Now, now I'm sure he had some days of concern with what was going on in his life. I would be foolish to say he would just sit there and say, ah, oh, just take me out, leukemia, don't matter to me. Ah, oh, yeah, here we go. No. I'll never forget a conversation I had with my dad. I, I was young in ministry doing youth pastor at work, and, and, uh, and I was young, and, and I found out that, you know, it was 2009, I believe. Uh, was it 2009? Yeah, 2009. He got diagnosed with stage 4 leukemia. Man, I was upset. I was mad. I watched a man, who, his life turned around. God delivered him from drug addiction. 60 months, he didn't draw one sober breath. God delivered him, restored his mind. When the Bible says it'll restore your mind, it'll restore your mind. He wasn't supposed to retain any knowledge. He wasn't supposed to be able to, to, to uh, articulate. He wasn't supposed to be able to do none of that. The Holy Spirit said, now nah, i got another plan. You surrendered, I'm going to give it all back. I'm going to restore back to you that the, that the canker worm and the palmer worm have eaten. I'm going to restore back those years. That's what the Scripture says. Joel chapter 2, right? See, he knows. He ain't forgot. Listen to this. <laughs> He's old and gray, but he ain't forgot. He still got a great mind on it. <laughs> Listen to this. I was upset and angry. I'll never forget. I figured I was going to go in there with my, my spiritual Smith and Weston. I'm, I'm going to pounce in there. Let my old, what's them things on the back of your boots? Spurs, Spurs click. Well, they'll know I'm coming. You know, you always hear that. You hear that music in them. Well, I love Weston. You hear that music, you hear those clean. You know, hey, that old man toting them guns coming in the door, Mitchell. So I figured I'd go into his office up there in Park Place. And I'd go in there. With, he could hear my old, what do you call them? Spurs. Spurs clicking and carrying on. I'd have my six-shooter. I want, I want to have two of them I can do like this, you know. But I, I'd do that, and I'd walk in there. And I'd let him know how I felt about this thing. Little did I know what was on the other end. I said, how could God allow this to happen to you? After all the things, he said, wait a minute, son. Don't you ever doubt my God. He said, I should have been dead already. He said, I'm living on God's time. I am his. And I said, well, God's going to heal you. He said, God ain't told me he was going to heal me. And he told me this. And it has stuck in my crawl. You know what a crawl is? You know what that is? That's what a bird it's got, some, it's got some things in there. That, this, you need to, it's spiritual too. It's got some stone. It goes in, 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 in it, it, grain or, or gravel and stuff. It pecks around and gets this gravel in its crawl so when it eats, it can grind it up. 
That's what happened to me that day. What he told me stuck in my craw, and I had to grind that thing out. I didn't truly accept it all at once, but the more I let it get in my craw and work, it started going to my extremity spiritually. He told me, he said, God didn't tell me he was going to heal me. He said he was going to sustain me until he was done. Mm. And that's what he told me. And at that moment, I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Your plan is better than mine. Because I could wish him healed today, and he could walk out and get shot by one of these drug addicts that live right here in this neighborhood. Your plan is better than mine because you've worked out all things for the good of him because I know he loves you. And that's what his word says. So that changed my mentality. Now, did that happen overnight? No. You know what I had to do? There was some due diligence that I had to do. I had to get in God's Word. I had to go back to that and study it. Now, Lord, what are your promises for me? What are your promises for me? What will cause me not to worry and be struck with it? I was anxious and, and, and was stricken with anxiety because the, the strongest person I ever knew in my life, he was going to die. God said, are you going to let me control this situation? Or are you going to worry and trust your other master? So you know what I did? I'm taking my hands off of it. Because no matter how much I love my father, I cannot heal him. Amen. I can't do it. But you love him a lot more than I can. And he's yours. So whatever you see fit, I don't know that me and him ever talked about leukemia after that day. Now, I know my sister, my mom, and them, they, they would call and say, well, daddy's blood count with us. I said, praise the Lord. Ain't nothing I can do. What you telling me for? I love him and I'm concerned, but I'm not going to worry. I don't want to hear that stuff if you want to pull me back down and make me feel oppressed about this situation again. Because I know that God has got it in his control. My father has surrendered his life to him. He's in control. I'm not. I'm letting go. That's the hardest thing I ever did in my life. Is letting go and saying, Lord, if he dies tomorrow, he's yours. He's yours. See, what are we holding on to? Is it just for our own selfish? Uh-oh, I said that word. <laughs> Is it just for our own selfish ambitions? Because we feel like we can't make it if they go. So, you know, Scripture says you can't serve two masters. I don't I take all the books up, counsel, get them out of here. I don't want nobody to throw a book at me. <laughs> a lot of us have a master that lives in our home, and it's called our children. We have set them up as our masters in our lives. We've set them up and they dictate how we serve God. They dictate how much control God has over situations. I just chose to go the opposite way. We've had a lot of situations in our house. I live with girls, women. You know we've had a lot of situations. <laughs> it's just me. And Coda. And Pepper. I do. I have a little, little pony too. He's a male and yep. <laughs> Still outnumbered by about six to three. We've had a lot of issues going on, you know, time to time in our lives, haven't we, baby? You know what I do? People ask me. You know what? Nope. You know why? Because I gave them to the Lord. Lord, they're yours. Why am I going to worry myself to death if I can't control it? And I realized really quick in life, as a father, as a pastor, there are situations in the church that I can't control. I give them to God. I give them to God. Say, Lord, your plan is the best. Your plan is great. I'm going to trust you with it. And therefore, I don't have to worry. I'm concerned. I'm always concerned about God's house, and about God's people. That is what he called me to do. But he did not call me to worry. So when you have situations going, if I don't look like I'm... Don't think I'm not a good pastor. 
because what I'm doing is this. Lord, you're the only one that can control this. You're our God, and you're sovereign, and your provision is perfect. And Lord, we love you. We honor you. Take care of the situation. And Lord, we'll be waiting for your word to be spoken over. And I just get up and say, in the name of Jesus, that's it. That's all I can do. But you need to do the same thing in your household, in your family. First thing you need to do, if you don't have anointing oil, get you some Wesson oil. Mm -hmm. Go on, anoint that house. Anoint every window. Anoint every door. Anoint every pillar. Every vehicle. Every animal. Anoint it. Say, God, I'm consecrating this to you. It's yours. Nothing can happen here unless you allow it. And trust him with it and watch what he does in your life. Amen. See, there's a lot of us have open doors for worry to come in that we don't want to close. Some of us, Lord help me here, some of us want to continue to worry because it draws attention. See, attention seekers want to take the glory from God, and when something happens, see, Mark Twain said it this way. He said, I've come to realize, he was an old man when he, when he penned this, he said, I've come to realize most of the things I worry about never, ever happened. He said, so I wasted a lot of time when I could have been doing something productive, and I wasted a lot of time by worrying. The Bible says, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. Listen to me. When you worry, listen to me. When you worry, you put yourself and elevate yourself to be the controlling factor in the situation. Because you feel like you can control what happens in it by your worrying. And you allow it to control you. So we've got to turn it over to God and allow Him. I'm fixing to close. We got some things to take care of. I want to tell you, the answer for your worry and anxiety is found in every book of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Every book. Now, you're not going to be able to write this down as fast as I'm going to say it, but I'm going to tell you. In Genesis, the seed of woman. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, the high priest. In Numbers, the cloud and the fire. In Deuteronomy, the prophet. In Joshua, the captain of our salvation. In Judges, the judge and the lawgiver. In Ruth, the kingsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, the prophet of the Lord. In First and Second Kings, in First and Second Chronicles, the reigning king. In Ezra, the faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, the rebuilder of the walls. In Esther, the advocate. In Job, the dayspring. In Psalms, our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, the wisdom of God. In Song of Solomon, the lover of our soul. In Isaiah, the suffering servant. In Jeremiah, and Lamentations, the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, a wheel within the middle of a will. And Daniel, the answer to the prayer. And Joel, the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. And Amos, the burden bearer. And Obadiah, the mighty Savior. And Jonah, the forgiving God. And Micah, the messenger. And Nahum, the avenger. And Habakkuk, the great evangelist. And Zephaniah, the restorer of the remnant. And Haggai, the cleansing fountain. And, Ze and Zechariah, the pierced son. And Malachi, the son of righteousness. And Matthew, the Messiah, the son of David. And Mark, the miracle worker. And Luke, the horn of salvation. And John, the only begotten son. And Acts, the ascended Lord. In Romans, the justifier in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, the first fruits. In Galatians, the one who sets us free. In Ephesians, the head over all things. In Philippians, the name above all names. In Galatians, Colossians, the fullness of the Godhead. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, the Lord of peace, the soon coming king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, the mediator. In Titus, the blessed hope. In Philemon, our closest friend. In Hebrews, the author and the finisher of our faith. And in James, the great physician. In 1st and 2nd Peter, the chief shepherd. 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the everlasting love, the eternal life. And in Jude, the only wise God and Savior. In the book of revelation. He is the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. That is your answer to anxiety and worry. It is the Word of God. Every book has an answer for what you're going through. Jesus has always been and He always will be the answer for your need. It's time we get back to Jesus. Yes. Instead of allowing everything else Try to control our situations. There's nothing 
that you could ever worry your little mind over that he can't take care of. Nothing. Nothing. So when you're struggling and anxiety and worry is causing you to do cartwheels mentally, emotionally. Because worry is just an emotion. That's all it is. It's just an emotion. And sometimes your emotion is like a roller coaster. You know, that's the way we do. Up and down, up and down. <clears throat> when it starts doing that, go to the book of Genesis and read about the seed of woman. When it continues to do that, go and find out who the wisdom of God is in Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> It continues to do that. Don't stop. Don't say, I did all I can do. Give up. No, keep going. I promise you, if you continue to search the Word, your worry will go away. Because He gives us a promise in His Word. He tells us, I'm a very present help in time of need. So when you need Him, He's all always there. He's never late. He's never on vacation. He's never too busy to attend unto you. When you need him, he's always there. Stand to your feet. Philippians 4, 6 and 7. I want to read this one more time. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. I'm going to ask you to do something. In your mind, there's several of you here today that are worrying. And you've had some bouts of anxiety just in the last few days. And you are worried about a situation or something that's going on in your life right now. I'm going to ask you to do what Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says. Verse 7 tells us this, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, you heard who Jesus was in every book of the Bible. You know the situation. Allow the Holy Spirit to bring the answer to your situation from His Word. Allow Him. You know what I said who God was through His Son in every book of the Bible? Allow Him to minister to you right now because you've got to do this. You've got to bring it before Him. You've got to pray. You've got to make supplication and allow Him to bring the God of peace because that is what's going to take place if you'll do what the Word's telling you to. No matter what it is, there's no situation too big. Seem too awful. Seem too terrible. It does not matter if it's, if it's emotional, physical, financially, spiritually. He can take care of all of it if you'll do what the Word says. We got to trust him with his word and trust him at his word. What he said he'll do. He loves you. So we're going to close out this service, this service this way. Whatever you're struggling with, if you're not struggling with anything, you're not worried and you're not anxious about something, I promise you there's somebody on either side of you that is. So pray for them. Pray for them. Just call their name to the Lord. But if there's a situation, as we close this out, we're going to pray together in concert. We're going to say, Lord, we need you. This situation that I'm facing, I cannot get through it without you. I'm surrendering it to you. You are sovereign. You are my providence. And you are my God. And I trust you with this situation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father.
We surrender all that we are to you. Our situations, the things that we're going through, we surrender to you. The one on the right or left that's going through it, Lord, I pray for them. I pray that you would help them. I pray that you would touch them through this situation that they're feeling anxious about or feeling worried about. I pray right now that you would minister to the situation by your power. Lord, you're never late. You're always on time. Lord, help us to trust you again. Help our unbelief. Help us to turn things over to you and realize that you are God and you are sovereign and you are almighty and you sent the answer to the cross of Calvary for us. And his name is Jesus. The work of the cross changes everything if we'll just believe it and walk in it. Lord, we're going to throw away this master that's no good. We're going to surrender to one master and let him be in control of our lives. Lord, I love you and I honor you and I give you praise for what you're doing. Lord, I know this task is not easy for us. And I know trusting is not an easy thing to do. But Lord, you'll help us through the situation. You'll help us through the task of trusting you. And nothing is impossible for you. And we love you and we honor you. Touch each and every person here. I pray a prayer of blessing and favor over each and every one of them, Lord. I pray right now that this thing that they're fighting against and they're at their wits end, Lord, strengthen them through the power of the Holy Spirit. What they're holding on to, Lord, allow them to let it go. What they're not holding on to tight enough, allow them to have strength and hold on to you. Lord, I love you and I honor you. And you are a great God. You are our Father. You're our Abba Father. And we can cry out to you in our time of need. Thank you, Lord. And we're going to seal it with the name above all names. We're going to seal it with the one that shed his blood. We're going to seal it with the answer that you give us. Jesus is his name. Amen and amen. Yes, hallelujah. If you would, before you move around, you can be seated. I'm going to sing a special for you. <laughs> Just kidding. I knew that would make you laugh. Um, you know, uh, many times, you know, we come to church and we go through things, we have programs for this, and, but one of the, my favorite things to do is to receive members in. Uh, and today is a first for me because uh, I've never got to receive my father and mother into a church before. They was always receiving me and kicking me out. But anyway, uh, uh, but, uh, but, I, but I get a double honor today because uh, my mother and father and this next one, Sister Nikki, both of them are long-term faithful servants of God. Both my mom and dad served for many years. Sister Nikki has served in the community. She is faithful. She's one of the most faithful people that I have come across in all of my years. She loves God with all her heart. She, she desires to serve God with a fervor. And she steps up to the plate. She's always there. And she's always saying, I want to help our community. And I thank God for her. It is an honor for us to receive Pastor Daddy. <laughs> and uh, mama, ain't nothing like a mama, and little sister, Nikki. So if y'all would come up here. Uh, and both, and, and both uh, I was going to say both couples, but there's only one couple and then, <laughs> then Nikki uh, and one single right now, right now. But anyway, uh, both uh, are long-term uh, Christians. Uh, uh, this, these two over here I had to do a little work on, but, but they're, they're getting there. They're getting there. They're getting there. Uh, no, uh, it's an honor. Uh, but they love the Lord. And I'm just going to let them affirm that today. I'm going to ask them a few questions. I'm going to charge them. See, it ain't too many times I get to charge my mom and dad with things. So I'm going I'm to take pride in this today. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 
I'm going to charge both of you, and, and you can just answer with yay or nay. It's better be yay for you. Uh, um, I want to charge you with, as, as being a member of the uh, Abbeville Church of God that you will love who God sends here, that you would be faithful in your tithing, your offering, and your fellowship, and whenever possible, you'll bless the pastor. <laughs> yes, yes, okay. See, that was easy enough. That wasn't hard, was it? That wasn't hard. But, uh, but I do love Sister Nikki, Bowie, and what's your name? Francis Sherfield and Terry Sherfield. I love them like they were my own, uh, and they are now. I get to shepherd and pastor some of the greatest people on the planet Earth right here at the Abbeville Church of God. I love you. So what we're going to do today... I want you to stretch your hand this way and pray for them. Uh, this is not something that we can take lightly. Being a member of a body, uh, a local body, is very important. It's biblical. It's scriptural. So, so I, I don't take it with uh, very lightly at all. I take it to heart, and I want to do the best I can to pastor um, the ones that pastored me so long, and then, and then someone that's new to us uh, for about six months almost now, somewhere close, five. Three, I'm sorry, three months, I'm sorry. <laughs> Seems like she's been here forever, three months. See, she's honest too. She wasn't going to get that extra credit. But anyway, uh, uh, for the last three months, and we've been blessed. Uh, Jump right in here with us, and, and, I, and I love both, uh, uh, both sides. Uh, so just stretch your hand this way and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray over... Uh, Brother and Sister Sherfield, and we pray over Sister Nikki. Lord, I pray that you would encourage them, strengthen them, allow them to do uh, the work that you would have them do here in the Abbeville Church of God. Lord, I pray that, that they would submit to you, surrender to you, your word, and Lord, I pray that they would honor this place, and I pray that they would honor you in everything that they do, and they re represent God first, and then Abbeville Church of God second. Lord, I love you, I honor you, and I give you praise in advance for sending these folks our way. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen and amen. What we want to do, Sister Nikki, you can come right over here. I'm going to let you start this way. 